Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be discussing some of the major antiplatelet drugs. These cells right here are platelets. And platelets are cells that are necessary for blood clotting and really helping to initiate the coagulation cascade. So if we have somebody who's at risk of developing a blood clot or even at risk of a stroke, in some cases these drugs may actually be warranted. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Now at the bottom of the screen here, understand that there's other types of drugs that we'll talk about in other videos. Over here we have the fibrinolytics. These are drugs that break down fibrin, so existing fibrin. So you already have to have an existing clot in order to use a fibrinolytic. So these help to activate plasmin and that degrades fibrin. These ones over here are anticoagulants. Now, down here at the bottom of the screen on the left, these are specifically anticoagulants that are directly affecting the coagulation cascade or some aspect of it. Technically, antiplatelet drugs are also anticoagulants. In fact, if you look up clopidogrel or Plavix, it will actually be in the class of anticoagulants. However, not all anticoagulants affect platelets. These anticoagulants down here are specifically affecting the co coagulation cascade. These ones up here are not. These are actually directly acting on platelets, although they do indirectly help to inhibit coagulation. All right, the first drug we're going to look at that's antiplatelet is aspirin, also called methyl salicylate. So in the blood vessel, which you see right here, we of course have the walls of the blood vessel, right? We can see them on the bottom and the top here. And certain cells, in particular the endothelial cells, have an enzyme called cyclooxygenase. And the one in particular here is COX-1 or cyclooxygenase 1. So this COX-1 enzyme normally becomes active in two conditions. Number one, when there's actually blood vessel damage. I mean, if you cut yourself, you want it to clot, right? So that's the normal case where it becomes active. But there's also another case where you have endothelial cell dysfunction. And that's something that we might see in diabetes mellitus, particularly type two, uh, when blood sugar is out of control or there's chronic inflammation or just cardiovascular disease in general. And in either case, when COX-1 becomes activated, one of the molecules it starts making is something called thromboxane A2, or just generally thromboxanes, you might hear. And these thromboxanes will bind to specific receptors um, in the platelets. I'm just calling it here the thromboxane A2 receptor. But in general, they bind to this receptor and it causes the platelet to become what we call sticky. This basically means that the platelet will start adhering to the vessel wall and then other platelets will start sticking to that platelet and you basically initiate the coagulation cascade because the platelets are necessary for that. Okay? But aspirin is an inhibitor of COX-1, not COX-2, only COX-1. And so by inhibiting COX-1, it's able to prevent the formation of thromboxane A2. And if you don't have any thromboxane A2, there's nothing to bind to the receptor on the platelets and the platelets don't become as adherent. Okay, so it basically prevents platelet adhesion to the vessel walls and platelet aggregation to other platelets. Also of note is that we have NSAID drugs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And when you talk about those in general, those are inhibitors of both COX-1 and COX-2, but aspirin specifically is mostly a COX-1 inhibitor. Now remember, we talked about two ways that these vessels become damaged or dysfunctional. One would just be physical damage. You actually cut yourself, in which case you want it to clot, right? Uh, or it could be dysfunctional as in the case of diseases like cardiovascular disease or diabetes, right? And one important thing to know is that these endothelial cells, regardless, are always secreting this molecule ADP, adenosine diphosphate. They are always making this and secreting it into the blood locally around the vessel. But healthy endothelial cells will also secrete an enzyme that degrades that ADP. Okay? If the vessel becomes damaged or is dysfunctional, it does not make the enzyme that degrades ADP. So the basic idea is, in an area of a healthy vessel, you will not have ADP. But in an area of damaged or dysfunctional vessels, you will have ADP because they're not making the enzyme to degrade it. 
One thing that ADP does is it binds to another receptor on these platelets called the P2Y12 receptor, kind of a weird name. But when ADP binds to this receptor, it does a similar thing to what the thromboxane did over here. It causes that platelet to kind of become sticky and it starts adhering to the vessel wall, aggregating with other platelets, and initiating that coagulation cascade, right? And so what we can do is to prevent ADP from binding to this receptor and initiating platelet adhesion and aggregation, we can use clopidogrel, also called Plavix. You've probably seen Plavix in a commercial. And this drug is gonna inhibit this receptor. It's gonna block ADP from binding. So if it blocks ADP from binding, then the platelet can't activate. And so the platelet more or less remains dormant in the blood. Now, one important thing about Plavix is that about 50% of individuals have a genetic polymorphism that renders it useless, meaning it will have no action on this receptor at all. And so this is a case where pharmacogenomics becomes extremely important because you don't just want to be giving this drug and just chancing it to see if it'll work for the patient. In a lot of patients, it does not work for whatever reason. They have a genetic difference that prevents it from working. So that would be one case where you'd want to do a genetic screen to make sure that Plavix is even going to work in the first place. So it may not work for every individual. It may work for some. Now, platelets also have another receptor, and I'm going to get rid of these for a second. And this is called a glycoprotein receptor. And there's several different glycoprotein receptors. There's a 1B, you can see here 2B and 3A. This should actually not be 3B, that should be 3A. But in any case, these glycoproteins are necessary for the platelet to be able to adhere to the vessel wall, okay? So when there is physical damage to the vessel wall, it exposes the underlying collagen of the extracellular matrix. And when the collagen becomes exposed, there's another protein that's circulating in the blood called von Willebrand factor, VWF. So if there's no collagen exposed, there will be no von Willebrand factor. But as soon as there's vessel damage of any kind, collagen's exposed, von Willebrand factor binds to that, and these glycoprotein receptors on the platelet bind to von Willebrand factor. So you sort of form this kind of almost train here of interconnected structures, and so this allows the platelet to stick to the vessel wall. The collagen binds von Willebrand factor, the von Willebrand factor binds this receptor, and therefore the platelet is able to uh, stick to the vessel wall, and then you get all those other events that we talked about, platelet adhesion and aggregation, right? Well, if we want to prevent this process, it would make sense to inhibit that glycoprotein, right? So there's a few drugs here that you can see. I'm not going to even try to pronounce those, but these are drugs that inhibit glycoprotein 2B, and this should be glycoprotein 3A. They don't actually act on the glycoprotein 1B, but all of those glycoproteins are necessary to facilitate binding to von Willebrand factor and therefore collagen. And so if we use these inhibitors, then the glycoprotein will be unable to bind von Willebrand factor and the platelet will not be able to stick to the vessel walls, okay? And remember, in any case, when these platelets do adhere to the vessel walls, right, that's called platelet adhesion, and then the aggregation involves other platelets binding to those platelets, and from there, that's kind of where we get the coagulation cascade initiated, okay? So by inhibiting platelets or being anti-platelet, we inhibit coagulation. But these drugs, as you can see, do not actually act on the individual enzymes within the coagulation cascade. They're acting prior to that at the platelets. And as with all of these drugs, whether it's the fibrinolytics or these anticoagulants or the antiplatelet drugs, all of these carry a risk of bleeding that you have to watch out for. So hopefully this video gave you some good information on the anticoagulant drugs that are specifically antiplatelet. In the next few videos, we'll be discussing warfarin and then also the other anticoagulants and fibrinolytic drugs. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.